much, Anne. And uh, welcome to all of the participants. It's a, it's a real pleasure to present us today this conversation, and we hope it turns into a conversation. Um, the conversation is about socio-ecological systems across the land-sea interface. Um, and uh, Cormac and myself will, will talk about and, and underlying to what we want to talk about is this, firstly, the concept of coast, uh, coastal socio-ecological systems. And secondly, this idea of seamless without borders. So by, by way of introduction, I just wanted to show you uh, these two concepts. So firstly, socio-ecological systems as a concept is quite well known and quite uh, well um, discussed in literature. But recently, there's quite a lot of emphasis on, on identifying the coast as a specific type of socio-ecological system. So we're not going to go into that discussion, but as a, as, a, as a framing for our discussion, we recognize the specificity of the coastal socio-ecological system. Secondly, we use this idea of seamless. Uh, and, and clearly, within the socio-ecological systems concept, there should be no seam between uh, the domains in our system. This is a bit tricky, though, on the coast, uh, with the ocean and the land and the coastal interface. Because uh, maybe in people's heads, there's a very clear line between the ocean and the land uh, in this interface. But if you look at the ecological system, it is seamless. It goes from land into ocean, and all that changes the medium from water to air. So, so in our discussion today, we have this, this concept that when we do planning for socio-ecological systems, it should be seamless between the oceans and the coast and the land, but is not. No matter how you look at a coastal socio-ecological -eco system, no matter how you try to perceive it, uh, it also ends up being hugely complex. So, so what you're looking at is a, is a three-hour attempt uh, to, to start organizing a, a coastal socio-ecological system in Nelson Mandela Bay in South Africa. So it, it contains thematically elements of the ecosystem in green, uh, some, some elements of coastal uh, use in blue, but as you can see, it's dominated by this by the social uh, policy and 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 politics and human side of the system. Uh, and if you view this coastal socio-ecological system through the through the lens of, for example, uh, management instruments, you basically get the same picture very quickly. That and and. By, by way of explanation, somewhere around here, there's a, there's a shoreline, the ocean on this side, the land on this side, and, and all of the features that you see in this, in this box uh, are some type of management instrument, a legal instrument, a policy instrument, um, a, a common use instrument. The point of this image is, and the previous one, at some point, when you start drawing these types of pictures, they become so complex that it's not, uh, it's not even possible to interpret it. And, and, that, and that's ultimately how we end up with these types of diagrams. I do it for the fun, but ultimately we, you, we have to stop because to, to try and interpret this and to try and intervene, uh, for example, by using a research approach is, is incredibly challenging. So today, if I can, if I can use this framing of circles of coastal sustainability, um, maybe give you an idea of what we will talk about in terms of of, of uh, socio-ecological systems. So if you if you take a look at this work, and they they basically combine uh, from the coastal zone things like the coastal boundaries, the human well-being, and socio-ecological systems into what, what these authors call the, um, the circles of coastal sustainability. So today, in this concept that draws together socio-ecological systems, Hormack and myself want to talk about a specific element 
in the system. And that's the governance and policy element of the socio-ecological system. So, and some of you may know some of these existing instruments, uh, for example, integrated coastal management, um, and the one in the middle is a depiction of marine spatial planning, um, and the one on the right is just a, a, policy, a, a policy implementation cycle for, for climate change. So, so this coast, the coastal ecological system, has this huge variety in, uh, in, in management instruments, in governance instruments, and today we want to, to talk a little bit about that complexity of the socio-ecological system. So I think to start off with, I'll, I'll hand over to Colmac, which will take uh, the first part of the, of the conversation. Thank you, Louis, for that introduction. I will just share my screen. So if you can bear with me for a minute, that should be now. Okay. Yeah, so I should start by saying that I am not a social ecological systems researcher. I've been working here at the Loifana University um, for the past 18 months, and I guess slowly I'm, I have a better understanding now of what social ecological systems are than when I started. Um, but suffice to say that I'm coming from an external perspective here in a sense, but my research has still very much been around society environment relations at the land sea interface. Um, <clears throat> So today I want to focus on two um, specific aspects in relation to my, my research, um, both in the, in the European context. The first is um, looking at the Watton Sea, which has been a, a core focus of my research from more, let's say, university-based um, fundamental research um, over the past number of years, looking at coastal management and protected area management at the Wadden Sea coast of Germany, Denmark, and the Netherlands. And the second aspect is really reflecting on current practice in ecosystem-based marine spatial planning. So what is happening currently with marine spatial plans in, in Europe and how, yeah, to what extent do we really have an ecosystem-based approach here? Um, and this has been the focus of some of my more applied work um, for NGOs looking at the alignment with EU environmental objectives. Currently, I'm also involved in the development of guidelines for cetacean-friendly marine spatial planning. So for harbour porpoises, dolphins, and whale species in Europe. And again, here, it's, it becomes very clear that there is a there's a real gap between what we know from a natural science perspective and what is possible then to implement in, a, um, in policy as well and uh, through um, planning practice. So we will start with the, with the Wadden Sea. And here we have a, a World Heritage Site at the coast. Um, and from my research really it has shown that there is a quite an artificial separation between spaces for nature and spaces for culture or spaces for people at the coast and this is in an institutional and policy sense in some ways this is very very deliberate in, in saying that the Watton Sea in front of the coast is a, a natural landscape or wilderness and that behind the dike line um, we have a, a cultural landscape where the people live. This, of course, is quite a simplistic perspective. It's quite, yeah, really emphasizes uh, nature society dichotomies. It's, it's really the case that the, the dike line continues to be a, a very powerful symbolic boundary at the coast. Um, so we find distinct policies and ways of working with the natural landscape, the Wadden Sea, and then the cultural landscape behind the dikes. And this division is, in fact, much stronger in the German case than it is in, in Denmark um, or the Netherlands. So there are distinctions there as well. Um, but it does make a, um, a substantial difference in practice. Um, that in this case, for example, a, in Schleswig-Holstein, a 
climate adaptation strategy for the Watton Sea. Um, and even though it's looking towards 2100, we have we only focus on the Watton Sea itself and we assume that the dikes will stay as they are. So again, you have this division between what is happening on either side of the of the dike line. Um, from a research perspective, it's the general approach is that um, the natural scientists are concerned with what happens in front of the dikes and the social scientists are concerned with sustainable development behind the dikes. Um, I'm part of a group who is trying to challenge some of these dichotomies, um, but that is an, an ongoing process. And, and like I say, there are, um, if you like, political with a small p reasons for why these dichotomies continue to uh, persist and why we continue to have a this boundary here that it's not a, a seamless approach. Um, so here we can see that there are there are reasons why we have um, this dichotomy and why it is still reproduced in current practice. If we move on to ecosystem-based marine spatial planning, here we have a, yeah, essentially it's a public sector process for coordinating the spatial and also temporal distribution of human activities at sea. That's what we're talking about here. We have an opportunity here to, uh, to bridge the land sea interface to make connections that would, were previously not there in policy. But in some respects, it can also be that the divide between terrestrial and marine spatial planning actually grows, that they become two different systems. So there are different dynamics at play here with national nuances as well. Within the European context, what's which what is very interesting from a, a socio-ecological systems perspective is that there is actually quite a strong stipulation within the directives that uh, marine spatial planning needs to be aligned with ecosystem protection objectives, with the achievement of good environmental status. Um, so this means that there needs to be an assessment of the cumulative impacts of all activities at sea, and that these should um, not be detrimental to the achievement um, and maintenance of good environmental status under the EU Marine Strategy Framework Directive. So essentially, in theory, what this means is a, a hard sustainability approach. Um, so, yeah, here we have an, an image from a very recent stakeholder meeting um, in the northwest of Ireland, uh, um, and it shows really the range of issues that are addressed through marine spatial planning. Um, that was the idea here to capture um, all of these uh, different perspectives and, um, and and really, this is just one discussion, but it's, it emphasized the different connectivities and the links between what is happening at land and what is happening at sea at different locations and scales as well, and the need for a, an integrated cross-sectoral perspective. One qu key question that I'm very interested in here is how the marine ecosystem is understood um, within these processes. Um, but first of all, actually, I'll move to one um, interesting example, uh, quite a creative example of an innovative approach to marine spatial planning. And th this is from the um, a long term strategy in the Netherlands. And if you look closely at this map, you will see that it has an inverse north south orientation. Um, the reason behind this was that they want to very deliberately say that this is the um, this is the view from the sea. So they wanted to, um, yeah, I mean, here the responsible minister in the Netherlands was arguing that we often think in terms of a watershed where the land stop, the sea starts, but actually we should start seeing the North Sea as part of the Netherlands in all its aspects. Um, so here they were saying, okay, we can do something different that a, a map in marine spatial planning can do more than just represent reality, but actually shift our perspectives and make us maybe see things from a different way. And I think this was quite a powerful approach of trying to change 
mindsets and really emphasize the, the linkages here as well. Um, within the Dutch context, then there was quite an emphasis on both ecological and economic development and trying to find synergies between the two also. So also emphasizing linkages in relation to ecosystem and economic aspects. Again, that is quite a quite a challenge and quite a challenge to do that in a way that really respects the limits of marine com um, conservation, but um, it's nevertheless quite an innovative approach. Um, yeah, so here again, you can see this in the text, um, this emphasis on connecting the land and the sea um, to keep the maritime nation alive. So we do see some efforts here to, to really try and bridge the land-sea interface, if you like, and come up with more innovative perspectives. Yeah, so if we move then to the question of how marine ecosystems are understood in marine spatial planning, does an ecosystem-based approach mean that we actually look at it in terms of um, social ecological systems that are connected? Um, the reality, I would say, is quite different in that there is a strong focus on what is measurable, what is quantifiable, what is known, and what is mappable. Um, what is mappable is very important. There is also, both within the marine spatial plans and the accompanying strategic environmental assessment reports, in a focus on discrete components rather than interactions. Um, so primarily in terms of environmental goods, uh, the benthos, birds, mammals, for example, in some cases also ecosystem services, um, and then also particular threats. So shipping, fishing, offshore wind, but generally viewed in the abstract. So the impact of shipping on harbor porpoises, for example, um, or the impact of offshore wind on birds, um, but not from an integrated system perspective. I would say it is um, primarily static rather than dynamic. So we have fixed zones and fixed protected areas, um, which cannot really take account of seasonal variations, for example. We have very slow reactions to external changes and new information. So overall, it's a static approach to planning for a dynamic complex system, yeah? Um, if you look a little bit more detail into existing practice, um, this example is from, from Sweden and um, it's a very high spatial resolution with a 250 by 250 meter grid um, with a, a matrix then of human pressures and ecosystem components. Um, but it's still quite a static model. Um, and it also has very particular boundaries with it not including coastal sources, for example, um, and can't really take into account complex interactions or dynamic change. So I think there's still a lot that needs to be done to really find an approach here that can uh, really assess what is happening at sea in a dynamic way um, that is then relevant for policy and planning. So what could a, a dynamic social ecological systems perspective be about? What would be necessary here? And this is very much open for discussion, but my initial reflections would be that, um, yeah, we really need to work with the complexity of marine ecosystems. We need for to address dynamic adaptation we, I think there's a lot of potential in real-time location-specific data, um, whether that's shipping data or data on uh, individual species, um, so that there can be dynamic responses. We need more flexible approaches to zoning. Um, and I think very importantly, we need to embrace uncertainty and recognize gaps in knowledge as well, and find sophisticated ways to, to deal with these issues rather than just focusing on what we know empirically, what we can empirically verify, because that's always going to be too, too limited. 
Um, so, yeah, these are some of the issues that I've been uh, reflecting on, on recently, some of the, the shortcomings in terms of existing practice and how they could potentially be addressed. So I will finish up there and um, so, yeah, thank you for listening. Um, I, the details you have here from my, um, my work as an independent researcher and consultant, which I will be um, doing on a full-time basis from April as well. Um, so yeah, with that, I will um, hand back over to, to Louis, who will provide, I think, some insights from his work in the African context. Thanks, Kumak. Uh, I like the way that you that you condition your uh, your your uh, your lo your locality or your positioning to its uh, socio ecological systems research. So I'll do the same. Uh, Twenty years ago, I was a coral reef uh, ecologist. So I have moved on from uh, what I never thought I would do, but I ended up in in this position. A state of happily getting lost in coastal socio-ecological system governance. Um, I had yesterday evening a discussion with a student that wanted to uh, write a paper about governance baselines that is universally applicable uh, in local settings around the world. So it was. It is a beautiful ambition. But uh, I think what I'll show you now is how, re how difficult, how challenging it is uh, to generalize governance in um, uh, co coastal governance. I'll talk, I'll talk about it in a socio-ecological systems context. I think we cannot, in our, in our work, uh, avoid the fact that we work with complex systems. Um, I'm, I'm not going to talk much about this is a, an older piece of work. Um, but I'll, I'll make reference to it, but it, it frames my conversation this, this afternoon. I think most of you would have seen this very simplified value chain, if I can call it that. And it relates to mostly in our setting to science and to the science that we create and the data that we create, the data from which we create information, the information which becomes admissible to managers and to decision makers, which then actually makes wiser decisions. So it's this kind of idealized uh, information hierarchy. And, and um, I would like to use this, this framing uh, to talk about governance and, and this information hierarchy and, and just move it and, and specifically focus at the, at the apex of the of the diagram this this concepts of knowledge and wisdom but just to um, give you a little bit more background about this this is from a paper which we call the last mile because we believe last mile of course being a transportation term that basically says that the, the biggest cost for uh, getting your package delivered from amazon is in the last mile for a variety of reasons which i'm not going to go into but in this paper, we, we say the same thing, that to get from knowledge to wisdom is where a huge amount of cost is locked away, which we do not recognize often. Um, and if I, can, if I can explain it in this way, the, the diagram in the paper, uh, we, we conclude it by saying, this is, this is a great diagram, this data, information, knowledge, and wisdom flow. But in fact, it doesn't work when you look at local coastal governance. And we especially, and, and this instance was for, was for climate data to go through this, uh, through this progression, through this uh, evolution from data to wisdom in a coastal context uh, for the purposes of adaptation. And, and we, we ended up uh, Suggest, suggesting that there's actually a counter a counter balance or a, a inverse argument uh, that we can bring to the original data hierarchy to, to make it work. So it was this inverse relationship where, where in science we focus on the data and in, in the information provision. 
and we to a certain and I simplify we we assume the the uptake of knowledge and we assume the the percolation of our of our, our scientific data into wisdom we actually found that it's not quite that simple in fact uh, the 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 counterbalance for this is this concept of access usability and capacity governance stakeholders decision making processes trust politics bureaucracy leadership and power now i'm not going to discuss this in great detail the paper is out you can go and have a look at it but it it frames a little bit the complexity of of local governance um, of a coastal system a complex coastal socio-ecological system so if we want to inform wisdom if we want to drive wisdom the processes are much more complex than we can imagine at first so so this frames my thinking when we work in local places local coastal places so remember i said that we want to i, I want to tell you about the knowledge and wisdom part of this so my my conversation will focus a little bit on on let's say a uh, elaboration of uh, of of that part of the diagram and the first one is is this this recognition that when we talk about stakeholders of a socio ecological system a coastal socio ecological system that you need more than just a map of stakeholders you you need more than just a container of stakeholders of representation there's actually something which we call a stratification of stakeholders. So in, in, in other words, there are these strata of stakeholders in your system, uh, which we need to recognize, firstly identify, then we need to put them in these strata and then, and then find a way to work with them in these strata. So, and the way we do that is, is simply by, it's not simply, but the way we do it is we actually measure the agency. So each stakeholder in your socio-ecological system will have a form of agency. And in this paper, we measure this agency by, by three factors uh, and, and a number of indicators to those. Resources, scale, and power. So if you combine those three in a stakeholder, um, for example, a stakeholder that is not mandated to make or to, to, to change something in the system for, let's say, for example, uh, climate adaptation on the coast. If, if it's not mandated to do so, they are already at a disadvantage. Uh, if they don't have any legislative power, or if they do have legislative power, they, they, the measure of agency is so much higher. But then you also get something which we call moral suasion, for example. And moral suasion is simply this ability of a stakeholder to move people, uh, to move many people, for example, and you would you would know this this concept of moral suasion from politics. So what we're basically saying is that um, we have to be a little bit more intentional when we talk about stakeholders in these complex systems. We need to we need to measure them a little bit. We need to poke them with our measuring stick and see what is their agency in relation to the problem that that we are trying to resolve or trying to address in the research and if i can elaborate a little bit on that we we took this measurement of agency and we created what we call stakeholder archetypes so an archetype is if you if you read the eisenach work is just a scientifically valid generalization so if you look at a, a, a quite a common a constellation of, of coastal stakeholders in a, in a local place. You can group them like this. You can group them by, uh, by type, government, parastatal, civil society. And then you can group them by subdivisions. You can group them by research, advocacy in the civil society or government, local government, national government. And it looks great, but it does not represent reality in terms of the agency they, that, that they um, that they have. So what we suggest is, if you can measure agency, you can measure the ability to act, you can group them, and you can put them in these archetypes, assign these archetypes. And once you have the archetypes, you can, 
you can plan who you want to engage with at what stage and what do you want to achieve by engaging with this particular group how do you how do you use the state the your knowledge of stakeholder um, um, agency in the research and in the intervention that you want to achieve through your research so just one thing to remember an, an interesting question is uh, organizations or agencies with low agency are they limited by interest or do they have a low agency by limited advantage this is some of the interesting things that we found that some of the communities that would be in an archetype, in an archetype <clears throat> stakeholder group would have a low agency but not because they are not interested but just simply because they are disadvantaged and then the last part of um, the elaboration of the wisdom and knowledge part of the initial diagram is this concept of social innovation in socio-ecological systems. So, and, and social innovation is, is any action by individuals, organizations, and networks to generate novel solutions um, that contribute to change. So, so what we're saying in these complex systems, coastal socio-ecological systems, we are basically at the limit of our ability to change things uh, by just producing more scientific outputs. So better understanding of climate vulnerability or modeling of waves or modeling of, of climate in those places or even biodiversity. So just producing, I, I, Apologies for the for the use of the word just, but it's from my perspective, the natural science and the the bulk of natural science that that is intended to drive wisdom. In our contention is just not going to push us that step forward to start transforming to its sustainability. So so what we what we're saying in this in this work that you can it's hot off the press, I think either today or tomorrow it will be online. Um, th there are a number of social innovations that will, and, and these social innovations we've identified through a review process, and it, and it reflects a change in the way that we think about, and this is, uh, sorry, reflections in science. This is the kind of work that we're reading in the, in the, in the very recent literature from 2018 onwards. The kind of things that we are reading that are starting to suggest ways of moving into transformation to its sustainability. And it's things like, for example, um, the way in which we communicate our science and the use of, of concepts like science fiction in, in storytelling, when, when we discuss our science and when we, when we bring our science to uh, non-scientific stakeholders, the idea of creating ocean futures or futuring or creating science, science fiction narratives, for example, or um, again, linking this concept of moral suasion and peer pressure. I think we all aware of the, of the power of social media and the, the moral suasion, both positive and negative of, of social media that could be part of the innovation uh, to its sustainability. And then, uh, in terms of, of a, a governance um, innovation, social innovation, is this concept of policy integration from ocean to land that you just heard from, from uh, Cormac. So there are a number of things in, in science that we are starting to think about that links to social innovation that are quite different and that we contend will move us into, a, into greater opportunity for for transformation, for transformation to its higher degrees of sustainability. So what, in conclusion, coastal governance is a key element of coastal socio-ecological systems and transformation to its sustainability. There's no doubt about that. If we can move, if we can move people through either social innovation or, or use their own inherent power in a system to affect change, then we will start moving to its sustainability. And secondly, social innovation is needed to accelerate to its sustainability. Uh, the term accelerate is one that I would like to use more and more and more because we need to accelerate 
what we do as scientists. We need to accelerate our, uh, our science into society because we need to keep up with this, this incredible negative trend in climate change and biodiversity. We actually need to outstrip that trend so that we can start gaining uh, ground towards sustainability. And then where to next? Coastal governance baselines, benchmarks, models, uh, the role and, and mode of transdisciplinarity in coastal socio-ecological systems, uh, with particular emphasis on scaling and, and power differential. Uh, because we we speak easily about the coast and the and the ocean being connected, but there are huge scaling effects um, from the ocean space to to the land side. 